that as most of these recommendations, although we make them to the secretary, do actually include reference to various agencies within HSS, that, that we might ask the ex officios to report back on what has happened with those recommendations in, in terms of if they've had any communication from the secretary's office. And so I, Lenny has some input. Just, just point of order, um, at least it's my recollection that um, during the last two of our meetings, um, Wanda had said that she would personally um, meet with representatives above her, which was probably Dr. Koh, and come back to us and give us action plans as to whether the recommendations had been met, endorsed, or were still being considered. So I'd be interested in knowing, kind of given that that was a, um, a communication that had been given to our um, advisory committee, where that recommendation s stands. Do you want me to answer that, Nancy, or do you want to answer that? So I, I, I mean, to share you, you, what you told me to answer. Well, I, I think that um, with this transition, I. I was unaware until you just said it that Wanda had um, talked about that. So we'll go forward and, and um, work on that. I think that it's, um, we should use the ex officios as well. I mean, I think there are multiple ways um, that we can uh, communicate with each other and get information from the agency. That's what the ex officios are here for, in, among other things. and. Knowing how this agency, this department works, I think that may in fact be uh, uh, the most efficient way to deal with it. The other thing is that, uh, as Dr. Coe mentioned, we have um, this new effort um, looking at a CFS strategy. And that is going to involve um, what, what's gonna happen is that the counselor to the secretary who is an immediate advisor is um, has drafted a memo I have seen a draft of that memo and it's going to all of the agency heads dr. Collins dr. Frieden etc and he is asking for a member of this strategic group uh, with quote high enough a high-level person with enough um, who, who a high-level person who can make decisions for the agency. So um, we, that should also, one of the things that we'll do is we, we will, um, since I am chairing that committee, we will take these recommendations and uh, the recommendations that come out of the meeting this, this time, this, uh, these two days, and that will be a point of discussion with this new group. Uh, yeah, you're going to punch that, yeah. Just again, another point of order, Chris uh, and Nancy. The last tab actually in our book has all the recommendations, and there's so many recommendations. My, my concern is that if we went through them all, we'd probably only get through the first page. So I guess I, I kind of wonder if there's a priority of which ones we should focus on, because there's really such a list of them, some of which have been acted upon, some of which have not, some of which, again, the key question is, why is it that we have no communication concerning recommendations that might be at the top of our priority? So I'd like to direct that question to you, Chris. <laughs> well, if it was up to me, <laughs> um, I, I, I think we need to push to get some feedback, and the, the, the problem is that, that we, we asked fairly forcibly last time to get some feedback, and, and it's, it's fallen into a black hole again. Uh, and so it's, I, it, it's, as we were discussing earlier, that there's a, a lack of continuity that compromises the function of this committee sometimes. That uh, it, It's unfortunate that, that we only meet twice a year, so although we, we have numerous telephone conversations, you know, things fall in between the gaps, uh, and we rely on the agencies to, to maintain some sort of continuity. Just another point of order, again, structurally, Chris, my understanding was that um, we were gonna have regular meetings um, with the 
chairs of the subcommittees, as well as yourself, as well as with uh, the leadership, including Dr. Koh, and that some of these issues were going to be resolved during the intermediate six months. And I'm wondering if you can give us any idea of whether that has happened over the last six months. Um, uh, th that has not happened. We we've had a, a number of meetings as subcommittees and as a, a leadership group. Uh, unfortunately, we did not get Dr. Coe's participation in any of those meetings in between this and the last meeting, which was a little disappointing. Chris, um, to extend what Lenny was saying, uh, by my quick count, there were 58 recommendations in that stack, 27 of which are as of yet unresolved as evidence that there's no check at the end. Uh, what about the group uh, parsing those into the rough categories, and it could be an object for, for our subcommittee meeting tomorrow of, uh, for lack of a better term, policy advocacy versus research, and I don't like that either. I mean, there, there's, it's, we're kind of trying to be arbitrary. And maybe prioritize making the recommendation, cut some of these down. Cut, cut them down to two or three strong recommendations with, uh, a, 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 to be fair, I think that maybe that they're getting lost, the, the trees are getting lost because of the forest. So cut the forest down to the most uh, relevant trees. I think if you read a lot of them, that they're, they're just recreations of the same recommendation. Exactly my point. We, we just tried to rewrite the language to make it a little more. So we make the point of getting rid of, consolidate, put them together, get rid of the ones that are either no longer relevant uh, or that we think at the moment are unattainable. I won't say get rid of them, maybe withdraw them. Uh, start getting things done that can be done, that, the, that uh, the Secretary can act on that moves us forward to show progress that, that would, and, and then, you know, be rational about how, what we're going to be able to affect. Yeah. We want to change the name, we want to change the name Chronic Fatigue Syndrome to ME. We're not going to be able to affect that change immediately. Uh, there are more immediate things that we can do, and then we can begin to advocate for that in other ways, in the literature, with evidence base, and so on, and continue that up there. But, and, and I just use that as an example, because that's one of the recommendations that's been on the table for over five years. Okay, Galen, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and actually I, I agree with that. Identify. I'm sorry. Everybody needs sure. to. Sure. Um, I'm Galen. I mean, I'm Lenny. Sorry. <laughs> actually, I'm Galen. <laughs> um, um, Lenny Jason to Paul. I, I, I guess the question I have, um, and I agree with what you said, Galen, and, and that is um, a year ago um, we had a very interesting meeting um, where um, Wanda mentioned to us and said it for the public that the recommendations that we had been making had not made their way up to the secretary and that she was going to do everything possible to make sure that that process was fixed and that we were going to somehow have a better system set up. This was at the meeting um, a year ago, and it's in the public record. Um, so I guess the question I have is it seems like somehow between our recommendations and the secretary, the mechanism of the secretary then coming back and actually making action has sometimes been problematic. And it seems like at that that's one level that we might need to get clarification. Has that problem been fixed? Possibly it has been, but I'm not sure about it. And, and I think um, until we get that thing dealt with, we could probably come up with the best recommendations in the world, but if nothing's going to happen with them, then I wonder kind of what do we do about it? Well, let me add to that, Galen Marshall, uh, let me add to that that we're an advisory committee to the secretary. I think it would be incredibly naive to suggest that she's going to take all of our advice. I don't know if you've ever, in trying to make decisions, if you've ever sought advice from people that you trusted and respected, you were more likely to respond to them than people you don't know, but it didn't compel you because they're giving you advice. It didn't compel you that you have to do it. I think we, I, I think though, if you have an advisor, I'm just using this on a personal basis. If you have an advisor, you're asking their advice, and you decide to do something different, particularly when they've been invested and they're really gone to the effort to prepare and give you what they consider to be sound advice, 
out of respect and courtesy, you go back and tell them and saying, you know, you really had some good ideas and I took this part of it, but I decided not to take that part of it. In other words, you gave feedback. And I think what you're suggesting is that we're missing that part because it doesn't really help us. And, I, and Nancy, I think this is information that you might take back through Dr. Coe. It doesn't really help us to know if we, if we put these recommendations out, we never hear anything. Are they falling on deaf ears? Are they good ideas, but they're not quite what they need to be? Are they being implemented and we don't know anything about it? I think the feedback part of that helps us do our job better. I, I've made that point a number of times, and, and, and it, it, it's what frustrates me because it's, it's not the way I work, and that may be a little naive, that, that if you make a suggestion or a recommendation to somebody, you do expect them to come back and say, oh, we don't like this or we can't do that. And you, you end up in a dialogue and some negotiation, and it, it's frustrating when you never get to, to go beyond making the recommendation. I mean, we accept that, you know, perhaps they're not perfect, you know, and, and they may not be achievable, but at least somebody could come back and say to us, well, look, this looks like a good idea, but, you know, we only have the funding for this. Can we negotiate here about how that might be operationalized? And that, that doesn't happen. So it, it, it almost feels like deja vu whenever we turn up at one of these meetings again and, and we go through the same routines and, and we leave, and it was exactly the same as last time. So I, I appreciate everybody else's frustration, and I can't believe how long we've actually been here, and and and, 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 and we're still asking these questions. Yeah, I just want to say something. Uh, in terms of just looking at this chart, um, some of the recommendations which uh, HHS supposedly fulfilled, like increasing public awareness, is it now that they just did one thing? Is that sort of fulfill their responsibility? They just <laughs> The, the, you know, Everybody uh, if told it, somebody they knew. Yeah. If, if you look at some of these um, recommendations that HHS supposedly has implemented, like developing a pub, CDC has developed a public awareness campaign and then they check off that that's been completed, does, does that imply that that's the end, that we're not going to continue to work? I guess what I'd like to do is maybe to clean up this list a bit and, and clarify whether anything has really been done. I mean, if and I think also we need to make a list of should we have each committee decide on what two or three recommendations we are going to make and how to follow through in between meetings, uh, say on telephone conversations or whatever. Uh, just a point looking at the um, chart. Some of these recommendations go as far back as 2004. They seem out to, yeah. Yeah, and so mean. they did it then, and so maybe it's time to do another one, for example. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking something like that. So, yeah. So to s part Just of it, you have to, it's a, part of it, one. you have to take the time into consideration. Mm -hmm. That's my only advice on that. Just as a point of order, I'm one of the people who circled off this committee in 2007 when I came on the committee and Chris came on the committee and Nancy came on the committee. Um, actually, more than one person who was on that committee um, came up with some of those 2004 to 2007 recommendations. And in 2007, um, I was told by several people cycling off this committee that 10 different recommendations had been ultimately made just as they left. And when I asked the pointed question, what had happened with those recommendations, um, the unfortunate response was, um, as far as they con were concerned, nothing had happened. Conversation stopper, any? <laughs> um, where we haven't been most productive is, is when the agencies have actually responded to some of the things that we've said in these meetings, and, and they've they've put their hands out and offered to work with us independently of, of recommendations. But but that's been relatively uh, few and far between, just because of the way things operate. So it it would also be nice to perhaps understand the level of autonomy that, that many of the uh, organizations within HHS have to see whether we can suggest uh, direct working relationships with those entities or whether that's outside of the, the mandate of the, the CIFSAC, I don't know. That 
Uh, one of the problems is when we recommend something that somebody doesn't like, then ge generally we get referred to the fact that we're just here to make recommendations to the secretary, which seems one way of uh, avoiding confronting difficult issues, uh, which, which again, you know, can be a little dis disappointing. Well, uh, let me say this without sounding seditious, uh, because I'm not, I'm not trying to. But we're not only, uh, uh, all, all the things that we talk about and all the testimony that we hear matter of public record. And I'll take the science piece that Lenny and, and uh, um, I guess Lenny, really it was Lenny's idea and he and Beth and Jordan uh, put uh, legs to it. And we're about to have a forum for this that's gonna extend that is not a formal part of our role as advisors and we did this with the blessings of Wanda. We had a, you recall, we had a conference call to make sure we were dotting our I's and crossing our T's correctly. I don't think there's anything that stops that in the literature where other issues are related to, to issues related to disability, to issues related to coding, and so on. There are literatures out there, and by getting the dialogue started and showing it in a scholarly fashion, I don't think we're in running anyone. Uh, we're not we're not being disingenuous to our role as advisors to the secretary, which is really the reason we are here. But it doesn't stop us as individuals from gathering that information and using it in a conscionable way to advance the field in all the different aspects. And I think, again, Lenny and Beth and Jordan have sort of set the bar for us in in other areas of the things that we deal with. I get the word out and. Um, I'm, I'm probably saying something wrong, and if I am, I, I, I don't mean any offense, but if, uh, if I'm in trouble and if I get drummed out, so be it. Politicians respond to letters, and politicians respond to public pressure, and they respond to a wider spread public pressure than what maybe they perceive that there would be. So getting the word out in a, in a scholarly fashion, A, for all of us that like to think of ourselves as rational, helps us contemplate and think about things in advance the field, and at the same time, it doesn't deny the reality of how things get done inside of our governmental system of which we are all participants. Um, I, the, the things that we've achieved outside of that making recommendations to the secretary, the, the, the things that, that really I'm most proud of uh, uh, that we've done on the committee, and really they moderate the level of frustration that I have relative to the recommendations. Uh, you know, otherwise, I would be leaving with a really heavy heart. I think we do, we have achieved some very positive gains, but, but they've had very little to do with any recommendations that we've made at, at this point. So, so Chris, I, I would say that, uh, in agreeing with Gail, and this is Lenny Jason again, that um, the good thing is that we have mobilized a tremendous amount of public interest, and that there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who look to us for leadership and that we have some remarkably well-connected, bright kind of um, HHH em employees here who really want to work and help. Um, and, and we hear what they're saying, and, and they're really making contributions. So the question is, yes, we've done a lot. The question now is how we as a committee can do more and how we can figure out how to get through some of these snags we have. One of the things Mike Miller said so well, multiple times with, with, with Wanda's encouragement, is that we sometimes have too many wishes, and we have so many things that are needed that we get the diffuse, as Galen has also mentioned. So, so I agree with, uh, I'll support what Galen has said, as several others have done as too, that to the extent that we can kind of really have a couple targeted, focused objectives, and we can stay with them, and we can make consistent progress with them, kind of month after month after year after year, um, we have a better chance of ultimately being effective. Right. Uh, yeah, just along those lines. Uh, uh, Elaine Perry, oh, CMS. Uh, Elaine Perry with CMS, sorry. Uh, along those lines, I just I had a question about process for Nancy and, and perhaps for the committee also. Uh, some of the recommendations are kind of cut and dry, you know, increased funding for X, and that's pretty clear what that means. And some 
are at the other end of the spectrum where, you know, for example, the recommendation from the recent uh, May meeting about developing the national research and clinical network uh, is something that, you know, really interesting idea, but something that would need to be fleshed out considerably. You know, what would that look like? What would go into it? Um, there's a lot of planning that and design work that would need to be done even before you get to the steps of actually, you know, funding and establishing things. And so I guess the process question I had is, is there a role, you know, in the time that you guys have to make recommendations and vote on them, you know, if you have very little time to discuss it, you know, you don't in that, you know, hour or so have time to design, you know, an entire complex structure. Is there a role for the committee, either as parts of the committee or the committee as a whole or the committee with other outside researchers to, to work on further fleshing out um, recommendations that are made and taking them further um, than, than they appear in this, you know, three sentence summary here, or is that HHS's role at that point where, you know, we take it and then we do whatever we may do or not if, do? If you look at the last recommendation in the list, Elaine, it says, uh, engage the expertise of CIFSAC as HHS moves forward to advance policy and agency responses to the health crisis that is MECFS which is very general, but, but it, it's, it's putting forward that we're here and available and whatever expertise we have uh, it, it, it is, is available to the, to the department in, to, in consultation for any of the larger projects. Here, yeah, and several members tapped by the NAH to serve on the planning committee for state of the knowledge, which is one example of that coming off. And the other thing, some of the recommendations start to get a little broad because we kept being told that we couldn't have the very specific ones and, and we keep trying for some national network centers of excellence uh, and, and it's, it's another way of trying to get that national network together but at least leave some room for negotiation about what it looks like. I mean, we're, we're not adamant that it has to adopt a particular model. We just want it to at least get off the ground. And uh, yes, sir. Teresa. Uh, Terry Michelle, FDA. Uh, lest the departing members of the committee feel that they have not uh, contributed, I just wanted to be very clear that at FDA, your efforts, although they were not a specific recommendation to FDA, are the direct result of the report that I just gave you. With all of our energies trying to focus our resources and provide a better interface for drug development. And so please know that your efforts are respected and appreciated and we are actively acting on them, whether or not they are written down in a checkbox. Eileen. Last name. Eileen Holderman. Holderman. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. I think the, the biggest concern is not so much from the ex officios here as it is from the secretary of the DHHS, because we are hearing feedback from the ex officios here and your reports are important to us, I think we need to have some kind of protocol or strategy, uh, maybe discuss with Dr. Koh in the next leadership meeting exactly what he would like from us in the way of developing, um, you know, a, a system where we are answered, you know, for a where we give the recommendations and we get a specific answer to it. Because what we don't want to do is spend a lot of time developing it um, if we know it's not even going to be heard at the preliminary level. Because if, if, if we get even a, a confirmation that there's interest, then I think this whole committee, there's no question about it, would absolutely develop any of those recommendations to the fullest. So we just need really uh, the, the, the step from Dr. Coe and Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary Sebelius. Steve Krafchik. Yeah. Steve Krafchik. Um, What's your affiliation, Steve? Just uh, give a plug for the law firm. Seattle and, and the Kraftchik Law Firm in Seattle. 
Um, you know, I, I share, I, I've only been on the committee for, gosh, is it a year now? I don't know. It, it just seems there is a level of frustration. And when I look at the list of, of recommendations, they are clearly categorizable. And you could, you could probably crunch a couple of them into one as you go through it. But I think the point, I, I was struck by the point that was just made, is that that kind of feedback saying, oh, well, this isn't specific enough. What do you really mean? Well, we could have grappled with that if somebody had told us that on any one of these at any point in time and maybe made it more useful. And I think with the working group that's inside of, of HHS now, maybe that's a vehicle for getting things accomplished more so than we have in the past with a collaborative relationship. Uh, one thing for future consideration, Dr. Coe said this morning that they were looking to change the charter and expand this group, well, and that, that would make it a perfect vehicle for, for smaller working groups within SIFSEC to operate outside of this particular meeting and, and do things in, in between the meetings that, that would be particularly productive. Nancy. Uh, this is Nancy Lee. Uh, I'm thinking that um, what I can do next is um, have um, Dr. Coe be on one or more leadership calls. Um, and this is what we ask of him. How do you suggest that we set up a system, work it through, whatever, to get feedback on <clears throat> these recommendations and let him, I, I think it's going to be a discussion. We're going to all come up with a solution. Um, I don't think he knows the answer and I don't think we do. But um, that's something that I think would be a start. What, what's going to happen after we have that discussion with him is unknown because we haven't had the discussion. But um, I think that that's a good agenda item for the leadership call. I, I'm just hearing today that, that he's thinking about revising the charter and changing the structure of the committee. Well, we have to revise the structure. Yeah, we but, have to, the but, charter has to be redone. But if we'd have known ahead of time that that was a, a possibility, that could have been a major discussion item for this meeting and we could have come prepared to think about what, what sort of things would we recommend, what changes would we recommend to SIFSEC. Well, and we can do that we can. over the course of the next six months. So, so our, input, not our input would be Absolutely. welcome on that. Okay. That was the plan all along. Uh, Nancy Klamas. From Miami. From Miami. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the, the recurring themes in our many, many uh, resolutions has been this idea of centers of excellence. And I know that, I mean, since David Bell made it the number one priority three SIFSACs ago, to now, um, it just is the recurring theme, recurring theme. Sometimes we hear from the ex officios some little nuggets that make you think you can almost pull it off because there's the concept of maybe demonstration projects for education or demonstration projects for clinical care, um, NIH um, clinical trials networks, and so on. So, so when you put this sort of spider web of possibilities together, you can. You can almost create a center of excellence that incorporates different components. If it's possible to try to challenge the ex officios in a very real way to come up with that precious concept, how could it be done? I know you can't just throw, or maybe you can, but you suppose that you can't throw, create a few centers, but you could create centers in another kind of way. Even if it's a virtual platform, it's possible to, to think creatively and help us with the struggle with this concept. Because what you're hearing over and over and over again from our, from our patients is that they can't access knowledgeable care. And we're saying, well, we can't give it to you because you haven't done the clinical trials. Well, we can't do the clinical trials because there's no center that has an adequate patient base that does Research. The researchers can't access large enough ends of patients because there's no research integrated clinical sites are very, very few, and so on. It's just like this little vicious little thread you pull and it just keep, the whole garment comes apart. And so, so if we could sort of reweave it the other way, how do we thread it into something that is 
what exactly what we need. Challenge, challenge the ex officios. Think through your center's capacities. What can we do in a very real way? Not conceptually, well, maybe there's this or that. What can we do? Can we make a working group that really creates the network needed to create these centers? So it could, I think it's very doable. And from what I hear, this just sounds like there's resources we have just not tapped. And, and Nancy, I'd just like to support what you just said, that that could be a recommendation somehow that where we could not only have the ex officios as they have told us again and again, the nuggets that we've had difficulty bringing together, if we could make that a recommendation, if we could get the secretary and Dr. Koh also working with us on that, and we could just bring all these pieces together and make it work and keep our focus on that and not give up. And if it takes us a couple years, we will keep focusing on that because it's doable if we don't get distracted by everything else. I, I guess I'd just add my two cents. Steve Kraftchick. Steve Kraftchick in Seattle. Um, it seems to me that we've heard about this ECHO project and we've heard about uh, various other research and, and in the affordable care area funding and things like that. It would take somebody at the secretary's level to say, if we wanted to do a couple centers of excellence, maybe we could fund it by taking a little bit from here and a little bit from here and a little bit from there and have a joint funding effort of some kind. It just, I, I share Nancy's view. It just seemed to me that there were tantalizing pieces that come out, but not any concerted effort to see if it really would be doable. So I would echo what Nancy's talking about. Lenny, I think it would make a big difference. Because we don't know how to navigate. And, and, it, and it seems really workable. You know, if somebody says, well, I've got this piece of it. Has anybody else got the other piece? And then you right. could start to look about how it fits together. And it should be cost effective if, if it's done over a number of different agencies. And it may actually not cost money. It may ultimately save money, which would be a huge selling point. Well, it would certainly help the patients in their quality of life and quality of care if it were done. Well, we're over time. Usually, if I don't get any questions from the students in about 10 seconds, I'll do a countdown and call an end to class. But uh, it, if, if there are no more comments, I will accept a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? So moved. Thank you very much. Good day, guys.